I am very, very, very proud and pleased indeed to, to present you Heine Goebbels, who, um, if you talk about Heine Goebbels or if you read about him, you will find words like a true Renaissance person, or you can find words like enfant terrible, <laughs> leftist, scientist, um, theater man, philosopher, Yes, <laughs> composer and theater man, of course, very much theater man. But sometimes you feel that Heiner might be going away from theater, or is he actually changing our conception of theater? Has he changed our conception of space and time when he was here? three years ago with his mind-blowing Erari Chari Chaka. But it all started with music, that much we know. Could you, could you tell about this road, how it started and where are you now? I know it's a big task. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I must say that I didn't plan the road. The road was actually offered. And there was a lot of crossings in which somebody waved in another direction. I immediately followed. <laughs> so um, I started as a composer, yes, as a musician, as a composer. Um, but, and I worked for theater. And I think this was a very hard but very constructive training. I was composing for other directors. And in other directors in, with theater plays in which the music didn't have a... Um, a fundamental role, but more an illustrative role to cover when the curtain was going down or to illustrate um, a certain mood or temperature. And so I could actually train my tools as a composer, but at the same time I was very frustrated about two things, about um, the chances which music and other elements of theatre had because it was a very hierarchical, organized way of uh, theater, um, of text-based theater. And on the other hand, it was, um, I was very unhappy with the, with the um, role of text and how text was spoken and how the musicality of a text was actually ign ignored in normal theater with a too, much, uh, a too much emphasis on the meaning of the text. And there was no emphasis anymore, and this is probably a very char uh, basic characteristicum of, of German theatre, after post-war theatre. It was exclusively, um, um, there was a weight on the meaning of text. And other qualities of sound, of rhythm, of melody, of expression, and of um, even opposition of what the text meant and the way you speak it, and musicality, all the other elements uh, have been ignored. And that's why after a certain point I withdraw from composing theater, music for theater, and I developed my own, um, own stage, which was an acoustic stage first for radio plays. And in this radio plays I could very alone and without any restrictions, without any compromises, I could uh, invent and compose a new way of relationship between words and music. And I could, for example, I didn't even have to deal with the psychology of an actor. Uh, I had just recorded the voice of an actor and then I was cutting it into pieces. And then I put between two words, I put some music or a noise, and then I played it again to this actor, and he said, wow, I, I didn't, uh, didn't think this was possible. And uh, so by this, actually, I got, I think, a reputation, also a certain respect, uh, that people could trust me also to go maybe a step further towards the stage, back to the stage, back to the visuals again. But uh, there's also an earlier period that was very political, and as I, as I understand that your roots are with Hans Eisler and with Musiktheater, as, as the Germans call it, and there was a period of the 
you had an orchestra or a band called Sogenanntes Linkradikales Blase Orchester. So, so the <laughs> and, and then there was an other famous band coming right after that. And of course, uh, uh, you studied sociology also from, from the beginning. And, 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 and what I understand with the politics, rules, philosophies, and then you sort of leave that all behind you and start to create new systems of thinking, new systems? No. No. <laughs> no. Actually, on my way to Stockholm yesterday on the airport, I met Joschka Fischer. He was flying in another direction, but uh, he, you know him. He was a, a foreign minister of uh, yes. Germany. In the, and um, I was living with him in a, in a squatted house in the 70s. So we belonged to the same political movement. I mean, he was a leader and I was a follower. And, and um, I was doing music. Um, no, I didn't leave it behind. I think there's a strong continuity. Uh, there's a strong continuity in one way that we never considered music as a tool to make politics. Not even in the 70s. We were part of a so-called spontanist movement, sponti movement. Uh, so we thought about life in general, and not only about um, um, representing um, oppressed and and um, and total uh, people and fighting against totalitarian systems. We also squatted very um, pleasant houses, and not the not the small ones. We we squatted the big ones, and. Um, so we considered life as a general, as a, as a, as a, um, as a topic to discuss in, on all levels. And we discovered music not, as, a, as I said, as a propaganda instrument to, make a, um, a, to play a march uh, on the demonstration, but as an expression of our ways of living together or our ways of, of discussing very, very um, polyphone. Uh, very different meanings, opinions at the same time, and uh, so we had no dogmatic approach. And um, and what I think, what I learned in this brass band in the in the middle 70s was that, and this was a very important uh, experience, that it was possible to have a collective uh, for an artistic project, and that um, teamwork is not losing. Uh, energy for an artistic purpose, but that um, even the the process of collective uh, creation of and and a very critical common discussion about about art and about aesthetics. That's what we did. We discussed aesthetics. We discussed chords, musical chords, or the pragmatism of simple pieces and complex pieces, and. Those collective discussion about the aesthetics of the uh, of the music in the 70s was something which I think I learned for the rest of my life, and I also learned that it's possible to not to insist on your own um, own eigentum. What's that? Eigentum. Eigentum. Um, property. 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 Yes, property. that you don't mm -hmm. insist on your artistic property, but you can deliver it and offer it and somebody can make use of it. And when I compare this with, um, with uh, my collaboration with Ensemble Moderne, which is an ensemble for contemporary music, also self-organized, it doesn't have an artistic director, or when I um, work with, with my own team in, 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 in my theater productions, I really am um, very happy that I went through this political lecture in a way, um, to f to reflect the conditions, uh, the working conditions um, for artworks, also in a political way, and I think this is one part which is still very lively in my in my work. The other part is that um, uh, we also back then and here now we discuss very um, intensively. Um, the role of the spectator, the importance of experience rather than considering music or theater as an element of making statements about reality, but considering them as an aesthetical, artistic reality in itself. Collective creation, indeed. Uh, 
you started by telling, I can vividly see you in this room where you are cutting, cutting the, the tape in, into, into pieces and assembling them, them again and, and creating that kind of new worlds. But then uh, when you come into the theatrical system, doing this complex work that you are doing right now, what comes first? What is, what is the... Is, is, is your music, the form, the, the, these fantastic pictures, these enigmas that you are presenting us, what is the, what is the order of them and, and how, do you, how do you manage to, to, to persuade everybody to, to go into this fantastically complicated world? I like very much that you speak about this theatre system <laughs> because I never work in this <laughs> theatre system. I work in a very small, mostly, I work in a very small theatre on Théâtre Vidi in Lausanne with a very small team. Uh, members are here. And, uh, um, and the, we construct the team for a production only uh, with the necessity of the project itself. And um, there's a long, there's a long um, continuity in, in collaboration with my set designer, with my sound designer, the more than 20 years, with, even with the technicians for light and stage of the theatre. And um, there's, I think, three things important. First of all, there is no order. So, because you said, what is the order of how? Yes, yes, yes. There's no order. We try, and that's a difficult point for the theatre, we try to work with everything at the same time. So, um, when you see this piece tonight, I went to the house but did not enter. We started two years, and that's the second point, we start very, very early. We started two years before the opening with already two, three days with the singers of the Hilliard Ensemble. And in order to find out what else can they offer, what else are they interested, how to learn each other to know, and, um, and to make experiments in which everything is possible. And that's the third thing, I think, which is important for my work. I don't have a, a vision of the... I don't have a complete vision of what I'm doing. I have um, a starting point, I have... Um, Maybe I have a question, or two questions, or three, and I have some desires from several sides. Um, for example, for this production, it was the idea, the desire of the Hilliard Ensemble to work with me, and for me, it was the desire to work with them, and to discover something which we both don't know yet. So. Th when you start two years in ahead, then you can have this freedom. If you have only six weeks of rehearsal, you have to know pretty much what you're doing yes. because you will end up in a mess otherwise. Yes. But um, so we worked, started two years ago without my music. So music was not the starting mm -hmm. point without knowing the texts. So the texts were not the starting point. The, the idea was, the starting point was, I think for me, but more on a subconscious level, was that I loved very much that this group of four British gentlemen um, who have great personalities, which you will see tonight, but on the other hand, they have the ability to create a fifth voice uh, in which they can all disappear. Mm. Uh, all their individual voices can disappear in a common voice which they have, which they are famous for since 40 years, with, especially with uh, pre-baroque music, also contemporary music. So they have a, they created a voice in which everybody is part of. Um, and I was interested, now I have to speak a little bit more about, about my projects, after Era Ritya Ritya and after another production which I did after this, um, in which nobody was on stage anymore. It's a production called Stifters Dinge, only with pianos and water and ice and fog and stones and metal. So the, the term of absence, of visual absence, um, or the absence of an incorporating body um, 
was very important for my research, and I consider theater as a research. And so what I liked is that with the Hilliard Ensemble, I have four bodies on stage, but when they start singing, they sort of all disappear to a fifth voice. So then after these first experiments, I found several texts in which the I, the ego, mm -hmm. yes, um, somehow is not secure, in which the I is disappearing or um, confused or polyphone or um, fragmented or um, in a crisis. Um, those, th actually four texts, those texts was one of uh, T.S. Eliot, mm -hmm. one of Maurice Blanchot, one of Franz Kafka, and one of uh, Samuel Beckett. Beckett. And then I started again with another experimental workshop with uh, the Hilliard Ensemble to work a little bit with the text. And I had maybe composed part of it, but it turned out not to be good. So we, we took it away and I composed again. And we, comp and we changed the composition within one year. And they were very happy that they could finally work with a living composer where they can, whom they can tell that it doesn't work. You are using the word, we did it. We, we, we changed the composition. Tell me about this collective, collective composition. I mean, co co composing. Usually you, 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 you think about, about a composer, you see Richard Wagner sitting in a castle somewhere and, and making all these dots on, on, on paper. And all of a sudden you say that we, we changed. We did this and we... Um, yes, how can I put it? Um, we change it means that, that, and that's another interesting thing, for the first time after 20 years or maybe 25 years, I was composing again at the piano, like Richard Wagner. <laughs> maybe slower, I was slower. <laughs> um, but I was sitting at the grand piano and, and this time I was in Berlin, and of course I was putting dots on paper, also for the first time since 25 years, because usually I work with composers, with, with, uh, co with um, computers, and I transfer computer, um, computer scores into um, voices and things like this. But for when you compose for a human voice, you can't do that. That's why I was sitting at the piano. And then we rehearsed it a bit. And then they made suggestions, and then they said, this is constantly, this level is too high, or mm -hmm. um, this together with this vocal, at this very moment, the chord doesn't really sound well. And then I went back to the Wagner uh, position and <laughs> changed that. So because, as you say, uh, the composition process then uh, is more uh, individual one, one, but there was a permanent feedback between the performers and uh, my writing. How much, how much room is there for improvisation? Or do you use what we call improvisation as a method or...? In this piece, um, there was only improvisation, musically only improvisation for me while I compose. But in other pieces, um, for example, when I worked with, uh, with the Ensemble Moderne um, on black on white, a bigger project for for 18 players, or um, when I worked with African musicians and with jazz musicians, then we improvised a lot and I recorded it and maybe I fixed certain things. In the end, I must say, my theater plays are quite precise because um, the elements who are involved, and they're all uh, involved in a very uh, prominent way, so the light is as important as the, the, the text and the text as the music and the music as the stage. Um, and when you have such a complex play of, of different disciplines uh, with different technicians behind them or artists behind them or performers behind them, then it is too complex to, to improvise. Otherwise, somebody, uh, some, uh, some moment a wall falls down and and it's a wrong moment, and you can't improvise with a falling wall. So um, it's very precise. But in the process, the improvisation has a big part. Yes, yes. Um, I try to recall my, 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 from my school, 
Let us go then, you and I, as the evening is spread upon the sky like a patient etherized on the operation table. Or indeed there will be decisions and indecisions, visions, visions and revisions before the taking of the toast and the tea. That is already music, even it's badly when, when recited. It is already there. There's, tell me about this. Was this was from Proof Rock? This was this is a part of tonight's uh, performance, the love song of, of Alfred J. Proof Rock by T. S. Eliot. Tell us about how you carry about to 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 enter into this strictly formal world of Eliot. Perhaps most 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 formal of these 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 four is Eliot, isn't it? Um, it is was not easy because um, generally I would say a poem doesn't need mu music because a poem is already music and uh, it is already translated into sound and to rhythm and breaking a rhythm and into making sense and taking sense away. And that was what, what a good poem uh, uh, makes it. Um, that, and that is why you will find me avoiding to superimpose uh, big musical ideas on, on the, this text. Because I thought, as you suggest, just suggested, that the music of the poem, the, the rhythm of the poem, is already music. And... Um, and it would be completely wrong um, to to fragment it and to break it because it is very beautifully composed by by T. S. Eliot himself. He was very musical in the way he 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 always plays with with entering a phrase. He was plays with um, introducing. Um, a rhythmical phrase, and once you get used, before you get used to it, he breaks it. Yes. For example, and you would completely take this pleasure away if you invent your own rhythm to it. What contemporary music mostly does, and it's a very famous quote by Bertolt Brecht, who says that that is a problem of contemporary music. That uh, when he said that in the 40s, that they they don't trust um, the rhythm of a text, and they they completely. Um, are dissolving it into 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 more psychologically expressive um, um, landscape, which has nothing to do with the with the body of a text, and um, and that's why I wanted to be very respectful with the, with the rhythm of of um, T. S. Eliot, um, because I'm not about and this maybe goes back to what we discussed about property and about uh, aesthetics. Um, my p important point is not to be the, the, the owner of the musical idea. I just want to unlock the poem in a way. I would like to unlock, make it, make it to offer it to an, on an acoustic level to an audience. And uh, it's not important if somebody says, yes, but where is your music? This sounds like T.S. Like Eliot. It's even more, um, it's even more um, crucial when we talk about Beckett, um, Worst What Ho. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of his last texts. And um, I made the mistake to compose too much. That's, for example, an example where I... Um, thought I have to be a real composer who had with a lot of ideas and fantasies, but that's not the point. And if you have such a great piece of art, and I think this is a master masterpiece of, uh, of Samuel Beckett, one of his last big prose, which you never know: is this a story? Is this a prose? Is this a poem? Is this a litany? Is this a prayer? Is this pure music? And so I. I started with too much ideas and also together with the rehearsals with the Hilliard Ensemble and also with my own skepticism, uh, which is very um, present while I work, um, I reduced it more and more and more and more until I ended up 
with just a way of bringing the rhythm of Beckett in a slight musical form, which is beyond speaking voice. But and that's something. But that's something which is so important uh, about the Hilliard Ensemble. That that's an ensemble you can really understand what they sing. You can really uh, understand the words. That's why I was so happy about the collaboration with them. Yeah, and 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 that's of course a very interesting thing. L listening to this music, listening them sing, you actually you it's like reading, and that that also means that of course you 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 have you are very, very careful of the vowels, uh, to, to, to where, where, what kind of a tessitura you, 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 you use the music in, because obviously the human voice, if you, if you are singing very, very special, very high-pitched things, the, the vowels, they, they, they tend to distort. But, but in this, I mean, it's, it's like you, you would almost make a dissection of the, of the words, and you can, so the music actually makes it more accessible in a way, at the same yeah. time respecting yeah. the rhythm yeah. and the meaning. I like very much when that you come back to, to the reading, because that's when I generally think about theatre, um, even about Eraritya Ritjaka, which uh, I was able to show here three years ago. I think my, my biggest um, challenge is to keep the pleasure of reading a text, even when I put it on stage. That's very difficult, because as soon as you have a body incorporating a text, then you lose the visual imagination which you have uh, when you read the text, because you might imagine the body in a completely different way, or maybe you might not imagine the body, you might imagine only a voice. and. Um, that's something Bob Wilson once said, very, very um, convincing. He said, um, in a radio play, your, your visual imagination is endless. In a, in a silent movie, your acoustic imagination is endless. And that he tries to keep both spaces for imagination, even when he put something on stage and when you uh, when you read then it's even stronger because then your visual and acoustic imagination is endless so I try to find a way of putting things on stage and this piece is another example where the freedom you have when you read and maybe you even read back or you think about something else while you read and you forget those lines and you think about something and then when you read it the next day, you think about something else. So it's not, it's not a one-way street to read something. It's always a huge number of options, a huge layers, a high number of layers of meaning, of discovery, of possibilities in a text. And I try to find ways of staging who keep this reading quality. Um. Your music often comes together with words nowadays and, and with pictures nowadays, but you have also uh, composed a lot of orchestral works that, that prestigious orchestras like Berliner Philharmonica or the Wiener Philharmonica have been, have been uh, playing. Uh, do you still go back to the concert hall and, and, and uh, do you still compose for the concert hall and how does theatre effect, that composition, that com composing work? Honestly speaking, <laughs> um, I have difficulties to come back. Yes. Because uh, for two reasons. For, for one, one is that the process of composing an orchestra piece, like for the Berlin Philharmonics, um, um, is a very lonesome one. And I love the the inspiration and the the, the um, teamwork, and I always think that a group has more possibilities and ideas than just one brain. And and I'm very easily bored if I only get back what I have in mind. 
So I, I need in the artistic process to have a to have um, something which which uh, mirrors back maybe my starting point, but which um, surprises me. And that's something which cannot really happen in an orchestra composition, because you have to deliver the score, and in order to deliver the score, um, if you don't work randomly, then you have to, you need to know what you're writing down. So you know already it's, uh, how it sounds, and I know a lot of composers, uh, for them, the work is done when they've written it. Mm. They don't need to hear it anymore, mm. actually, and they don't, they don't even go to concerts, um, because they're already working on the next work, because they have everything in their head, and they're writing it down, and, and that's something which doesn't interest me at all. So I'm a little bit afraid of going back to this, but I have some commissions, to, uh, even one from the Berlin Philharmonics, which I have to answer in, in, the f in a few years. Um, but I'm looking for tools for um, other options, how to, how to be inspired for this. And the, the second uh, thing which makes it difficult for me to, to ignore my experience on theater is um, that it is very hard to change a concert hall. This is built in um, with gravity, built in aesthetic of the 19th century, and you cannot really change it. Even with light it's difficult to change it because it's uh, wood uh, or light wood all around and um, the acoustic is impossible to change it because I usually love to amplify everything, even big orchestra, not in order to be louder but in order to separate the voices. Yeah. But those halls, the concert halls, they are built to melt. Yeah, they, they sort of equalize everything. Yes, yes they equalize yes, everything yes, in order yes. to melt it, to give it one big sound. Yes. And that's completely the opposite of what I'm looking for. I want to have dry rooms where I can hear, hear the first violin and there the second violin and there the cowbell or whatever. The perfect separation yes. of the uh, Because I grew up with pop music. Yes. So, uh, so I grew up with, uh, with the Beach Boys and yeah. they have already in the, in the, in the 60s, they, they have already such a fine... A transparent mix of, of all the different percussion instruments, for example. Um, and so I love to construct the entity, the acoustic entity, for example, of music. I love to construct it myself because I hear them separated. And you can use that also as a metaphor for my general approach to theater. I like to, to have the elements of theater separated in order that the audience can construct the, the total uh, the total work of art by themselves and in an in, in, in individual way. So that's something which is hard for me to accept with the orchestra music. And that's why, for example, I did um, uh, my last commission, which I had for two orchestras in London, which was 2007, was one orchestra from the, um, with original instruments, the orchestra in the Age of Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And it was the London Sinfonietta who is specialized on contemporary music. And they asked me to do a piece for both ensembles. And so I did a piece in which I made them read texts by Gertrude Stein. By, uh, text by Gertrude Stein from her book, um, Wars I Have Seen. Mm. And, um, and then I had these two groups on stage, but I separ and I separated them, but I didn't separate them with the groups, I mean the old instruments, new instruments, but I separated them by gender. So the women of both orchestras were sitting in front and reading Gertrude Stein while they played their violin or the cello, and the man had to sit in the back making sounds. <laughs> which was a nice thing, but it completely changed the the view on the on the orchestra setting, and that's why I was interested in this project. Yeah. But this means that we are fortunate to have you to possess you in the theater. Could you could you show us something? Some 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 of your recent recent reason. I I, I, th I brought some some uh, not only because Carlotta Engel is here in the audience, um, but also because I thought I could um, put um, another weight on the 
on the fact that I'm interested in, in texts which have a musical quality and texts which, which cross the, the lines, the disciplines between prose and poetry or between text and music. And this is a, basically a theme for tonight um, because in, uh, for tonight with the three authors which we present with the Hilliard Ensemble, four authors, um, all sorts of texts are somehow failing their, their genre. It's, an, it's, an, it's a sample of texts about failure. So, um, Tils, yes, Eliot fails to write a love poem, mm. you could say that. <laughs> and, um, and Maurice Blanchot uh, fails to, to deliver a story. He tries to, to, to write a story, but in the end we don't know who is who and if I... Uh, uh, especially who is the I in this story. Um, Kafka's, then there's a Kafka story who fails all the time, <laughs> uh, of course. And at the end we have this um, text by Samuel Beckett, which is, um, which is about <laughs> failing better. And it's called uh, Worst What Ho, and which is the biggest, I think, the, for me, the biggest utopian quality of language when it turns into something else. And, um, and probably since the beginning of my work with literature in the middle of the 80s, I'm looking for texts who have this formal um, provocation or this formal, formal um, experimental topic in their work. And it's very interesting with what uh, Einar Müller already once said. He said, the utopi, utopia lies in the form, not in what we say, but how we say it. And also my first the texts with which I worked by Heiner Müller uh, were always texts who had such a strong um, formal uh, approach that I could use them as a musical inspiration for finding a rhythm or finding a, a, a genre, a musical genre. Or I just, I just had to read and read and read and analyze the texts over and over again and read it with a magnifying glass and then I found all of a sudden, the musical form in it. And um, when Heiner Müller died in uh, 1996, oh no, he died actually in, in the last days of 1995, but when he was um, when he, at his funeral in the beginning of January 1996, um, Bob Wilson entered the stage in, of the ceremony in the Berlin Ensemble, and he read a part of Gertrude Stein's novel, The Making of Americans. And this was a shock for me. I didn't know this book. Um, I don't know who knows this book. It's a, it's a one has 1,000 pages, and it is um, nearly unreadable, um, because it is very repetitive, with a very small vocabulary, a very repetitive, um, way of thinking more than storytelling. It's it's the story of an American family, which, which uh, of the 19th century, um, of the ongoing development uh, of an um, American family. But she always drifts away from the from the concrete family, and she drifts away and speaks about mankind in general. And while she speaks in this in this um, rhythmical, repetitive. Um, nearly meditative way of of uh, writing, um, you sort of attend her her thoughts. And when Bob Wilson uh, read from this book at the funeral of Heiner Müller, uh, there's certain pages at the end of the Making of Americans from Gertrude Stein, where it says like he's going to be a dead one, and when he's going to be a dead one, then he was a dead one, and he was a living one, and then he was a dead one. And so he plays, uh, actually Gertrude Stein plays with those words um, uh, who evoke the memory of a dead person. And this was, especially at this very moment, such a um, liberating chance of hearing texts as music, and at the same time thinking about the dead one, giving me the freedom 
to let my memories and experiences and encounters with Heiner Müller and my collaborations and all these little and big and moments uh, in, in my life, let them pass, a, pass along while I was listening to text. Usually text doesn't allow that, but Gertrude Stein's musical text form allowed that. And so uh, this was a very uh, strong um, experience and um, Four years later, I did a piece called Hasherigaki, Hasherigaki with three female performers, Carlotta Engelkes from Sweden, Marie Goyette from Canada, and Yumiko Tanaka from Japan. And um, it is another example. It's a different way of literature than we will encounter tonight, but it's another example of literature at the border of, of semantics and music between semantics and music. And um, <clears throat> I thought maybe we could end up with just a little little um, excerpt from this piece. The music um, to this piece is not by myself, it's by the Beach Boys. <laughs> <laughs> one would be hearing if there were any noise, if there were a great deal of noise, if there were any noise for that one to be hearing. Someone is sometimes hearing very much noise. Sometimes that one is not hearing any noise. There is sometimes not any noise for that one to be hearing. A great deal of noise is something that one is sometimes hearing. Some smell something. Some smell a good many things. Some have a very strong feeling when they're smelling something. Some are smelling themselves when they're smelling something. Some are certain that smelling something is something they're always doing. Some are smelling something more when they are young ones than when they are older ones. Some are smelling themselves when they smell something more when they are young ones than when they are older ones. Some more when they are older ones than when they are young ones. Some all of their living, some all of their living are smelling something, are smelling themselves when they're smelling something. Some are smelling something and are then remembering something. Some are smelling something and are then completely remembering something. Some are very much interested in this thing in remembering something when they are smelling something. Some are not really interested in smelling anything. Some are interested in not smelling anything. It's a great question, this question of washing. One never can find anyone who can be satisfied with anybody else's washing. The French tell me it's the Italians who never do any washing. The French and the Italians both find the Spanish a little short in their washing. The English find all the world locks in this business of washing. And the East finds all the West a pig. Which never is clean with just this little cold water washing. And so it goes. There is always then repeating. Always. Everything is repeating. This is a history of every kind of repeating there is in living. This is then a history of every kind of living. Now we have to be very, I, I, I think we could stay here all evening. No, we have to see the show, of course. <laughs> but we have to be very strict with the time. Um, so I would like to ask if there's somebody who has the 
questions or reflections or about what you have seen, what you have heard? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, when I heard you talk a couple of years ago, this was, uh, this was around um, the performance festival, perfect performance festival, I guess. We were talking about the individuality of the experience in the audience, which was something that you, at the time, I think, found very satisfying for yourself, that, and which I, myself, found very satisfying watching the Rai Chaitra. Um, when, when seeing this, for example, I have a feeling that the music, it, it's hard to get past the music and have an individual feeling that's not colored by music. For me, it's easier to have an individual feeling if it's based more on tech. Is this some, when I also um, listen to Surrogate Cities, for example, and the way you use, um, and there's a chant by a, from a mosque, I think. That's no, from um, Jewish cantos. Yes, oh, Jewish cantos, yes. Um, which then is scored with strings, and this is very emotional. And I feel when I hear it that there's only one way to experience it. Is this a reason also why you don't like to work with music so much anymore? Because is the music maybe more definite? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, music can be more definite. Um, on an emotional side, um, and that's true. And I also have to admit that when I talk, for example, about absence, um, I mainly mean a visual absence, because because the visual presence is uh, strong. <laughs> It's very hard to answer the question. Uh, the visual presence, of course, is more uh, asking for you to identify with, for example, with somebody on stage. We, you mirror yourself in an actor, or, uh, and I'm looking for more maybe sort of a triangular relationship between yourself as an audience, between what's, uh, what's maybe happening acoustically or on stage, and uh, or maybe between what you see, what you hear, and yourself. So I work very much with the gap between the, between the um, um, acoustic stage and the visual stage. And I would say there could be a, a possible triangular, which um, avoids direct um, mirroring or ide ide identification. So I think um, the right answer to your question, for example, to such a piece would be that the music is less um, less convincing or less um, how how would you this uh, say it less emotionalizing if what we see has an independent life if you can choose and if there's a gap and always when there's an interruption or when there's a gap then you have a chance and um, so. When you hear this piece of surrogate cities, probably I would say it depends where you are and how you hear it, um, how free you are in reacting yourself. If you are on the motorway, or uh, if you hear, uh, if you're sitting in a concert hall, or if you hear it with a headphone, uh, laying uh, in a dark, in the dark, uh, in, in your sleeping room, um, of course you're more. Um, ausgeliefert, um, exposed to it. But um, I think for me it's a very important, and that's probably the reason why I prefer to work on, uh, on theater, on a music theater, on stage, because I can disconnect um, the visual side and the acoustic side. And this is probably the most liberating space we can get in theater. <laughs> now or in, in general ah now because I, pl I played a lot of instruments i started with piano when i was five and then i started to play cello when i was 12 and then i uh, learned myself uh, guitar when i was 14 and uh, saxophone when i was 21 uh, or 23 and um, 
so I was, uh, there was times when I was called a multi-instrumentalist, so I was never a virtuoso on one of those. But uh, it gave me the, the, the possibility to get some insight of different characteristics of instruments, which helps when you're composing. But now I only play the piano. And in the moment, because I have a, period, a busy period, I don't play it regularly, but when I play it regularly, then I mostly play Bach. Hmm. Hmm. In the beginning and in the end, there was Bach. <laughs> Come over here and tell us. Come there. Yeah, come, come there. I said, hey. 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 Uh, it was a it was a big uh, change in my in my my life. What I did afterwards also, and uh, I think the the meeting with you and the meeting with Gertrud Stein, and also this this love for the text was a big uh, was a big thing for me. And I remember that I could not do anything. I always wanted to suggest how to interpret the, the texts, and you didn't want me to do anything. Just trust in the text and just be there. Be there and do the text. And I was suffering. It was hard. And we did it in a quite fast period. In, in <laughs> No, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> and I remember I was rehearsing and rehearsing. And uh, everything I did, it was, everything was too much. Because, um, yeah, because you want to interpret it. But it was not possible. And it is very difficult to remember, of course, also the text. But this, I love, I still, I love it so much to pick it up, this production. Uh, as we did it for many times, eight, yeah, nine years. Oh, is it from there? Oh, okay, cool. And so this is very. What was the question again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working with uh, text mm. and music, with mm. or working just with text. Mm. I think. I mean, I, I always personally, I always worked with music and text uh, together, but. Um, um, the, the big experience is, of course, also this thing to not go with the music. Ap apropos the music, we don't go with the music. You go. Uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, uh, not necessarily against it, but. Uh, yeah, but you could. I mean, talking about Bach, you could describe the relationship. I like to look for the string, what we hear, what we get, uh, and what we see. I like to consider it like a counterpoint. Like, uh, so you do certain things in the music and then you don't do certain things in the visuals and then you do the opposite. And um, so, and you could even, you could even use this metaphor of polyphony on, on those elements. I mean, the light can take over the voice of this book in which, uh, we're, in which we are talking about. Because theater is at least four voices on stage. And uh, maybe more, and when you, and I think I try to compose them in a in a, in a counterpoint in a way of, of relationships to avoid that what classical theatre very often does that just amplifies one meaning or one interpretation, one figure, so that the costume fits and the text fits and the expression and the music is uh, and the and the stage and the light is showing. So you have like seven times the same. <coughs> expression, and I would l look for seven different expressions at the same time, and, and rather offer this uh, to an audience which is clever enough to make a choice. So tonight, I think that we all can make that choice, and um, we'll see each other down here. We are actually on the on the left side stage of the main stage and down there there's four gentlemen preparing themselves. Eight o'clock is a show, uh, half an hour before there will be an introduction in the marble hall. Please welcome 
back. And thank you, Heine, for coming, and thank you, Charlotte, for helping us. <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs>